We can lead ourselves by choosing how we want to show up. Let's make 2020 the year that we actually get some shit done. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Straight Talk with me, your host, Janice Otremba. Straight Talk is about having real conversations with leaders across Canada. It's about breaking through the noise and shining a light on some of the amazing minds that are having a positive impact in our communities as we navigate these unprecedented, challenging times. So today I'm sharing my conversation with Christina Benti. Christina is a speaker, an author, the former mayor of Golden, BC, and she's the owner of Strategic Leadership Solutions. Christina has worked across the country, informing, educating, and engaging local governments on sustainable service delivery opportunities and challenges. If you want to be a part of Straight Talk or have a leader in mind that would be a great fit, let's have a conversation. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome, Christina. Thanks for coming and playing in the sandbox with me. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> So one of the things that we know is going on for local government right now is there's a pandemic. If you haven't heard, let me be the first to share. <laughs> what? Right? No information for all of us as we all sit on Zoom having conversations now. Um, but, you know, in, I really want to bring your insight to the table around what does this mean? Because we're looking at local government relief, both federally, provincially, and also we're looking at at the municipal levels. That's being asked and requested of us. We are in a place where we're having to look and have some really, um, I'm going to say extraordinary conversations. So here in my own community, not only are we dealing with pandemic, but I live in the interior of BC. We have flood season coming. We have wildfire season coming. We have please stay six meters apart from everybody in the process. That's really hard to sandbag along the river when you're at. So there's some unique dynamics, but I also think there's probably opportunities in it as well. So I'll let you just jump in wherever you want to start. Sounds good. Actually, I think you you raised raised a huge issue around um, sustainability. And so much of, it's so interesting because so much of my work has focused on sustainability for local governments. Looking at, uh, you know, we use the term asset management, but it's actually managing assets and services for long-term sustainability. And um, for those of us who've been in the industry of sustainability for a long time, we've been saying, you everyone pay attention the check engine light is on we got to start paying attention yeah. and it, and what's interesting about this experience in the pandemic is that oh my gosh everyone's paying attention we're all paying attention to the fact that you know if we look inside of our own hearts and our own processes and our own systems we realize that we're like yeah this lifestyle isn't sustainable we've mm -hmm. um you know a lot of my work with local governments is we've overbuilt our environment and we've under invested in its long term sustainability. So what are we passing on to future generations? For example, in my community in the town of Golden, we built diking infrastructure with crushed cars. <laughs> You so the time, just, you know, to be respectful of the people in, in power, that was a good decision back then. Absolutely. It made, yeah. exactly, it made tons of sense. We used, we built um, civic centers with asbestos, right? That's what people did. And so the legislative environment has changed significantly. And so we've got all of this infrastructure and we ne haven't necessarily prepared for its renewal because the capital costs are approximately, when we build infrastructure, the capital costs are approximately 20% and operations, maintenance and renewal costs are about 80%. So as local governments in particular have continued to build shiny objects, which, yeah. which Great, right? And I mean, I was there. Um, I, I did that. We invested in new infrastructure, but we didn't take into account um, that it would age. <laughs> Do you find, so, you know, you and I both work with local government. Um, you work with more on 
my understanding is on more of the municipality and the sustainability and that whole piece of it. I tend to work more as an executive coach, the individual, the leadership side of it. And there's a difference between working with um, mayor and council or chief and council if we're working within a First Nations context versus the city administration. So, you know, your, your CAO, your corporate secretary, and then everybody right down to the bylaws officer that's out on a daily basis. It's a very different dichotomy when we're politically informed to make decisions. The bias has to be there around, you know, who is voting for me? How am I standing and being authentic in my own self, doing what the public, what my voter, my constituents have asked me to do? And yet at the city over here, we've got a different structure that they're paying attention to. Now, collectively, they're all working together. I get that. They're all working on our behalf. Yeah. But when I work with people within a municipality, whether it's on the, the council level or on the city side of it, there's three basic clients that they're dealing with or customers that you're dealing with all the time. We have the internal, what's going on with our own people. Yeah. We've got the public in terms of our community and then we've got the infrastructure whether that be federal or provincial and then imagine like it's an interesting little mix of how do you how do you it's messy i'm just gonna say it that is a messy agreement oh yeah and i and i think what's interesting about that is the fact that citizens in general are unaware of yeah. The, again, the, the constraints that exist for local government. And oftentimes you'll see politicians running on platforms that they can't actually deliver on because they're not at the right level of government to do that. But, but because we don't have civics in our school, we actually don't understand what those levels of government are. And so what's interesting about this, and I'm going to tie it back into the, the pandemic because I'm... Yeah. Um, and this might be a messy conversation, but I'm watching a lot of local governments right now and, and, and rightly so exploring the fact that um, there's some pushback from their residents and they want some tax relief. Now, what's important to recognize in the mix of the conversation is that it's not so simple. Local government gets approximately eight to nine cents on, for every tax dollar that you pay. The province gets 42 cents and the feds get 50 cents. Um, so local government delivers this broad range of service with a very limited revenue generating tools. But they also deliver services that impact your day-to-day -day life. So for example, our utilities are unsustainable. So currently if you're paying utilities and um, you don't have enough money in reserves and you're actually not paying for the full cost of receiving that service, yeah. then what is the long-term consequence of, say, reducing your uh, utility fees? Um, it, 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 it seems to make sense, but if you're actually not paying for the service that you receive, what are the long-term consequences of, say, robbing from reserves to cover the cost yeah. that what that all you're doing is kicking the can further down the road so well, it's, it's robbing peter to pay paul yeah so yeah. you're robbing the future yeah. you're robbing future generations for existing services and so what the here's an opportunity for local governments to actually look at first of all what are the services that we provide to our residents what level of service do we provide it at? And then what does it cost to provide that level of service? And who's gonna pay for what? So um, this is an opportunity for governments to look very strategically to define their current levels of service and link the cost to provide that service. Um, and that requires interorganizational alignment. So when you were talking earlier about the fact that um, you work on the, you know, do executive coaching, it is, it's how do we communicate within the organization to ensure that we're talking about the right things and that we're actually looking at the consequences. So when residents come and they want tax relief, 
elected officials actually have to grapple with what are we kicking down, what can are we kicking down the road, and is this the right thing to do? And maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. So wrestling yeah. with that is really key. Well, and I think that's where the transparency comes in around the conversations. It's here's what we're actually considering. And so I'm not suggesting that everything gets shared. <laughs> And so I appreciate, you know, from a transparency standpoint, we want that information. But I think in this kind of environment right now with the pandemic, with some of the issues that are coming down the pike, and we know they're coming down the pike, how are we able to actually inform our constituents? Because it's not just about the, the money and where that goes. We need to be saying, but this is why we're making this informed decision. But we're dealing with individuals that are also currently under a state of high state of stress. Yes. So, you know, in, in all of the work that I, I do with clients, it's there's behaviors that happen when things are going well, and then there's how we actually respond under stress and to what degree of stress do we feel threatened in that, do we feel unsafe or unsecure in our own life. So we're asking our elected leaders, we're asking our people within our city right now, essential services, to be making those really tough decisions recognizing that they're in this just as much as we are. So I, yeah. I really want to put that human element in here. It's they've got family that might or might not be infected with this and with COVID. They too are dealing with different stresses. And what I'm hearing though, is there's a them and us that's starting to happen that actually scares the crap out of me. Yes. It makes me really nervous when, well, yeah, but they're the one and we get this finger pointing kind of energy. And you know what? They're, they're human beings. They're doing their best. And I think it's that transparency that's going to actually save us. Mm -hmm. But as someone that's been in that arena for a long time, we'll just call you the gladiator that you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you've gone through those really big things, perhaps not pandemic, but I mean, I know you've gone through some really big things in terms of the, the city and the politics. How do you stand strong in that? How do you stand and be the calm in the center of the storm when you're, you're actually going through the same shit everybody else is? Yeah, I think it's really important to bring your humanity forward and to, um, and to acknowledge it. I have these emotions as well. I, I, I feel scared. I don't like disappointing people just by nature. Most politicians don't like when they're showing up to be of service. Exactly. They want to be of service and then they get to the table and like, well, this is way harder than I thought. I can't even do what I want to do. There's a, there's a lot of anxiety. And so it's having a conversation with yourself is how do I want to be seen to have led during this? Are you willing to grapple with the difficult decisions and do it in such a way that you maintain your integrity as a person, your humanity and I, I can tell you a little story um, one time. We, we had an issue in our community, and of course, I was mayor during the global economic crisis, and you would have thought that I started it in my community. <laughs> well, see, and I've been saying, like, you're, I know you've been in the ring. I know. Yeah. And, and that, you know, I, I learned it was a very dark time because all of a sudden a lot of stones were thrown. And people, and when you realize you're actually responding to people's fear, you're not talking to them, you're yeah. actually talking to their fear. And so if you can acknowledge, acknowledge the fear, acknowledge the emotion, but then be willing to make decisions on behalf of those who have not been born yet. And that's why I love the First Nations um, uh, you know, teachings around seventh generational thinking. I just, I, that has stayed with me in my work and it, and it informs my work. And so pre pandemic, I would often tell my clients, I'd be like, you know, those um, residents in the front row that are staring at you and are angry, don't take them out of the room, but mentally put them farther back and put the first generation, put future generations, put children in the front row. Put kids that haven't been born yet in the front row and go, how do I make decisions for you? And that's really tough because um, you think you're elected by the people that you're elected by, but you're actually elected by your future community. Correct. 
And that's a, that's a tough one and acknowledge it. I think there's a responsibility and I hope that I, you know what I hope, I really hope that some citizens are watching our, the, our conversation because there is a responsibility of citizens to set aside their own fears and anxieties and realize that their politicians are people and that they have very difficult decisions to make. And some of those decisions may be based on um, the, the need for them to make decisions around the future generation. And that might be unpopular. Well, and, and I do think it's unpopular because most people, and especially when they're in a high level state of stress, they want their own personal needs taken care of first. Totally. Then we will consider others. Yep. Then we will consider the context of the situation. Why do you think there's no toilet paper left? <laughs> Right? And you know who your friends are because they're willing to share. They're willing to step up and offer you some. I think it's really important when we talk about from the, the both the city side of it as well as then the council side of it, there is a lot of public facing that has to happen. I thought technology was a huge component of our life pre-pandemic. When you look at what is being required now of people to connect, have those important conversations, and they're not even in the same room. They're not in the energy of feeling it. We're doing it through this medium or one like it. There's, a, there's, there's more work that's required. It takes more energy to be present, to show up and to engage. You know, I was talking to a couple of clients that I work with, and they're, they're in this environment of local government, and yeah, they read the policy about the pandemic when they signed up and you read the book. Nobody ever thinks that you're going to actually engage in the policies. No disrespect. I'm really glad we've got that and good we've looked at it. That will never happen in my lifetime. Carry yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I, I, I often tell my clients, um, the, the, the elected officials, the word politician does not mean liar and dirtbag. It means policy setter. Policies are designed to serve people. And when they stop serving people, when they stop being human centric, then you need to revisit them. And, how and I think that's where we can get into that updating it as well. So you're saying, you know, we, we built a, a dike with old vehicles. Okay, yeah. we wouldn't do that anymore. No. So it's sort of, it's have we looked at stuff and said, is this relevant for where we want to go? Yeah. Is this still the best choice? Yeah. This is an opportunity in many ways to actually look inward, like not only personally, but also inwardly in terms of for, for local governments to look inward and go, how can we re reframe those policies? How can we look at our internal processes to ensure that they're human centric and community centric? Well, and even with the, with the awareness now that we all can work from home, that changes how we're going to be doing business going forward. Yeah, yeah. We, we now know things and we now know the productivity. We know that there's some advantages to doing this. There's disadvantages as well. But we have a whole new spectrum of information that literally got downloaded for everybody at once. Yeah. And local governments, in, in many ways, kudos to the local governments out there that are, that are, like, that are being, navigating this terrain very quickly. And they're well, adjusting, like, really, they are. really, it's amazing. I think that, for me, the most exciting thing about this time is that the rule book just got thrown out. Doesn't yeah. mean that we don't have some policy or some guidelines or things we want to follow, but really, well, why not try it? We don't know if it'll work. We've never been here before, so there, for me, and what I'm seeing with clients is there's a freedom in, well, let's give it a go and see what happens. Yep allow the messiness to inform how you course correct. And, and, and so if I, if I think about something I would particularly leave for local governments and governing bodies, but also the administrative body, don't forget to use some of your energy towards proactive thinking and strategic thinking around um, what is the future going to look like what, what are the questions that we need to ask ourselves? And in particular for local governments, it comes back to those, what are the services 
that our community wants and needs and what are they willing and able to pay for? And I think the, the, the question about what are they able to pay for, that's going to come to the forefront sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So, and as we start to wrap this up, one of the points that I want to bring back is, is taking back into that um, question that you brought, like when you're saying, who are the, the, the children that are not here yet? What, what am I able to build or set policy for in terms of taking that forward? Because I think that's where we can really lean into the sustainability. Sustainability isn't about the short term just doing this. It's how do I manage to create that so that 20, 30, 40 years down the road, there's a plan in place to keep course correcting and keep that on track. Yeah, you know, if that's where we want to go. So I think that's a really important piece is recognizing who we are coming to the table. But if we're all asking that question, so as much as we have the individuals, but if we can create that collaboration and that collective, if we're all asking the same, I'm going to say bigger questions, higher questions, the vision yeah. questions, yeah. that'll infuse and inform those decisions that we're actually making at the table today. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Thanks, Christina. I appreciate you being a part of this. Thank you. My immense pleasure. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs>